So, hello. Um, I'm German Swabian, so we start in time. It's exactly 12. <laughs> um, so the, the talk is about um, will AI um, kill the developer's job? Um, and it's a talk, um, at least in parts, talking about the future. Um, and therefore, a small disclaimer, it's my own personal opinion. Um, which I'm presenting here. Um, if you disagree with that, um, please raise your hand. I'm happy uh, to have a discussion about that, not about uh, too much about arguing it, um, but simply also to learning about other um, opinions about how AI will actually um, yeah, change um, our jobs um, at all. Um, if you want to say something, simply raise your hand. Uh, if I don't see you, stand up. Um, if that doesn't help, my name is Toby. Um, just call me out. Um, and yeah, then we, we are happy to go. Um, why I am giving this talk, um, I'm doing software development um, since yeah, 30 years, um, professionally for 25 years, something like that. I'm um, so really motivated since I'm a really small child um, and also interested in okay, what is actually changing in software development over the time. Um, and yeah, I'm also quite interested in the topic of uh, artificial intelligence, um, especially because I'm doing software development for a long time. I was also more always thinking about, okay, how can a computer actually be intelligent at all? Um, because I know how everything is working. I know assembler, I know the ones and the O's, um, and therefore it's always difficult to think about, okay, how this can be really intelligent. Um, so therefore I invested a lot of time into that um, over s the last years and now working in an AI company, still not an AI expert. Uh, we have experts for that in the company, but I said very enthusiastic, I'm interested. Um, and then we also founded um, an AI meetup in Frankfurt, which now has around 4,000 members. So that's happening on a monthly basis. So if you are ever in Frankfurt, um, please feel free uh, to join and come there because it's not only for the hardcore techies who are talking then about the formulas and the neural networks. Um, we also have a lot about talks about yeah, legal um, or philosophical things. So shall the autonomous car, if it must do an accident, now kill the baby or the grandmother? Um, or how AI um, will change um, our jobs at all. Um, and one news which was out there um, actually around a year ago, um, which yeah, surprised me that it's already happening, um, was the news, I think most of you have, have seen it, um, that Zalando um, actually replaced around 250 marketing jobs um, with an AI. Um, that was really surprising and somehow shocking for me because yeah, so far AI was about autonomous driving or some really future-driven Skynet um, things um, some, some people are thinking about. But now I'm um, doing software development for a very long time, being um, in several agencies. Um, I know a lot of marketing guys. Um, a lot of my friends are marketing guys. Um, so now it's really um, reflecting it in my own actually yeah, personal environment. Um, and I've seen, okay, something is changing out there. Um, but let's go to software development. Uh, I have a question. Who many software developers do we actually have in this room? Is everyone here a software developer? Okay, most of them. Um, I, I will cover as well some basics about software development, um, So, but I will try um, to do that fast. So. I try to here have a typical traditional process. Uh, this changed over the time, but a traditional process of building software is you have some kind of software development. So we are coding um, in our um, basement, actually, um, implementing something. Then there's uh, the next step, that's the quality assurance. So we are testing as it's working. Um, and then at the end, um, we have the operations part. Um, so something is running right now in the cloud. Uh, we need to monitor and check if everything is working. Um, and I very quickly also want to cover then the quality assurance and operations because again um, that highly yeah, influences uh, the software developer's job as well. And for quality assurance, um, I actually know a company which tried um, to implement an AI um, in a computer game um, to defeat um, human players. Um, and they have then basically defined yeah, two goals. Uh, the first goal should be that the AI should not lose the game, and the second was actually it should try to finish it as soon as possible. Um, that worked quite well in the beginning, um, and then at some point they found out, okay, now that AI is way faster than before. So it didn't need uh, now 10 or 15 minutes as before, it needed one or two seconds. Um, the reason for that is, um, as I said, the two KPIs was not losing and finishing the game as soon as possible, um, that AI found bugs uh, which crashed the game. Um, and th that was its definition of winning it. Um, so it was not only, um, it was not even on purpose um, building an AI helping them quality assurance. Um, they're actually using that right now um, in their work. Um, and it's helping and optimizing uh, the quality guys over there. So it's more or less even happening by accident. Um, if we talk about operations and 
don't get me wrong, operations is more or less about looking into metrics and then doing some actions. Um, so there's no offense, but if, if you want to sum it up, um, so you have some kind of metrics for CPU usage, memory usage, some business KPIs, could be any kind, and these um, have influences, like for example, there's a cron shop running every hour, so therefore you have then more CPU usage in the beginning of the hour than in the end of the hour, um, or something is based on a day, um, or if you um, visited the talk of Judith based on the weather, um, that you're selling um, more cake uh, when there's good weather or something like that. Um, so you actually also then need to define yeah, some kind of thresholds when you actually want to be allowed because uh, an operations guy does not simply want to look at 1,000 metrics all the day and have his 1,000 screens. He wants to automate that. Um, but if you have all these different influences, it's actually quite difficult uh, to then decide, okay, what are now the right thresholds and which moment, which you also again need to maintain. Um, but right now, the change. So this is a screenshot from a, a tool called Datadog. Um, these have been one of the first ones where I've seen a feature like that. So they are basically now using machine learning uh, to detect these patterns um, and then only send an alarm when they actually see, okay, there's some anomaly in the normal usage that we had, um, depending um, on the input uh, we, we were given uh, to this metric. Um, and even um, AWS um, has now in CloudWatch um, a similar feature, so it's really picking up um, and actually helps operations guys a lot because now you do not need to maintain manually um, the thresholds about all this. Um, but let's go to yeah, the software development, writing software um, code part. Um, my question is to you guys now, and I would like to see some hands, and um, no worries, I won't come to you and ask why. Who of you thinks um, that developers' efforts will be replaced by AI in the future. Yeah, that's five to 10%. I said, so I won't come to you, so don't be shy. Only five to 10%, okay, interesting. Um, there was actually um, a survey um, done by even Data Corporation in 2016, um, and they asked software developers what is their greatest fear um, about um, their job right now. And 29% um, of them said, um, I and my development efforts are replaced by artificial intelligence. Um, so at least when they have done um, that kind of, of survey, um, it was way more, um, already 29%. Might even be different right now, um, three years later, uh, where we can see the first things actually in implementation. Um, and there's then one more study um, from a US department um, that tells that by 2014, um, machines will write better code than humans. The really important part here for me is it will write better code. It's very obvious that it will write it way, way faster. Um, and this is, this is one thing um, which we also need to keep in mind with our current environment that was different 20, 30 years ago. But right now it's really expensive to write the code, but super cheap to run it. Um, also for 90% of the use cases out there, if your code is not 100% optimized, usually the user does not care about that. Um, that's quite unfortunate. Um, also with my heart soul of being a software developer, doing that for a very long time, loving clean code um, and everything like that. Um, but the truth is usually no one cares about it. It's not really 100% efficient. Um, it's just about delivering something fast. Um, now I would like first uh, to cover how technology actually changed development over the time. And we will start with HTML, CSS. Yes, that's no programming language, it's a markup language. Uh, we will cover to the real stuff later. Um, but let's have please a start here. Um, so this is how we have done web development. Um, yeah. 25 years ago, something like that. Uh, this is how I've implemented my first personal website, writing about my um, teenager hobbies, um, having uh, just some notepad, um, writing some code, um, no debugger, actually testing is um, now running the browser and seeing if it works. Um, there was also no developer console, nothing like that. If it doesn't work, you need to think about, read the whole code again and think about why it doesn't work. Um, this is how everything started, um, I think, actually, uh, for most of us. Um, then there was a huge progress um, also in the IDE, so now we have syntax highlighting. It actually tells us um, if, a, if the code is not closed or if you're not allowed to use it at some specific place, um, everything is stuff like that. And next step was actually that we had then you know, the so-called what you see is what you get editors. Um, so here's a screenshot um, of, of Wix.com. So yes, um, they, at least in the past, have produced really, really crappy code. 
Um, so it was not maintain maintainable at all. Um, but first of all, that changed over the time. And second, coming back to my first argument, it's not so important anymore if it's the perfect and really efficient code. Um, depends on what you want to do in the future. So if you need to really um, build up on that, um, build a more solid enterprise system, then yes, um, you need to make sure that you have um, everything clean um, and solid because you also need to um, give it other developers which need to extend the features, but if you're building a prototype, just want to test if something is working, um, tools like these work just fine. Um, but it's not AI at all, it's simple technology. Um, what is AI already oh, um, is um, a website called shots.ai. Um, and they claim right now that they um, have a technology out there where you can simply upload a screenshot um, of an app um, and it will then generate um, a website, so a responsive template out of that. Um, I say claim because right now they still did not release it, um, but at least on their website they have 6,000 uh, templates, so if they did not have an, an army of monkeys doing all these 6,000 templates, um, there seems to be something out there already. Um, I've, I've checked some of these, um, the responsiveness looks really good, um, it's easy to understand. Um, it actually then has also different buttons, input elements and stuff like that. Um, and AI I really seems to detect um, all these different kind of elements. As well as they are now working um, on an export for React Native, so it's not only generating a website, but also generating an app. Um, that could uh, work quite easy. Then technology changes in the real software world. Um, so no, no markup language anymore. Um, this is assembler. Uh, this is how codes have been written in the 1940s. Uh, so simply moving bytes in a memory from one place to another place. Um, and it's nothing else. Moving some kinds of bytes. There is no if, there is no loop, um, there's nothing like that. Um, and you need to know where you can actually now um, control which hardware device um, or, or software pattern um, on the memory to do something. So there's, for example, one exact um, memory um, point where you now can uh, define or change a pixel on your screen. Um, I've done that more for fun, um, so I'm not that old. Um, it was really interesting to see okay, how, the, how the real basics work, especially if you are then also dealing with hardware devices. Um, then there came in the, in the 50s Fortran. Um, Fortran is, I would say, like the, the first higher language um, out there. So now you have ifs, go to, loops, everything like that. Um, the stuff that you still know. Um, and yeah, current IDE looks like that. So now we have functions, um, object oriented programming, again, syntax highlighting, debuggers, profilers, um, chit integration, um, everything like that. Um, so that changed definitely massively. Um, and then there's one thing um, coming up, or uh, came up in the last years, that's the Stack Overflow Driven Development. Um, and this is actually um, a plugin uh, which is available for at least all IntelliJ um, IDEs, um, where you can simply copy paste um, yeah, the, the current string um, of the line where you are, um, that is automatically searching in Stack Overflow, and giving you probably um, an answer to the question that you have, even if you didn't ask the answer yet because you have the code line over there. Um, I was uh, implementing something similar some years ago when I was working in an e-commerce agency. Uh, we were dealing with Magento, which is an open source system, um, and actually that has hundreds and thousands of different classes and functions. Um, but um, when you are dealing with that stuff, usually you have to do the same operations and same kind of work all over the time. So the e-commerce shops are different in nuances, but the main logic which you want to implement is very, very similar. Um, therefore, I've implemented like there something like that, which is then automatically, whenever I open a file, um, sending the current file name, class name, and also the function where I am uh, to Stack Overflow and also giving me, the, me there the top five answers. Um, that helped a lot um, just to, to finding um, the right code that you actually need without starting to think about and also understanding what it's actually doing. Um, and then there's a one new um, plugin um, that is called Tab9, um, also available uh, for all IntelliJ um, IDEs and also others as well. Um, and this is now where the fun and the AI part um, actually begins um, because they have trained a neural network um, on two million GitHub files out there. And it's actually trying to predict um, how your line will continue. So we don't have any um, static code analysis uh, here, as you know it from normal code completion. It's really analyzed 
production code out there and not what you have written already, what you might write um, in, in the future as well. Um, so it's free for use um, if you want to have as a source these two million GitHub files. Um, it's actually a paid version and you can train it on your own um, projects and it will actually adapt um, then to your personal needs and to your personal coding style and also to your personal projects again. Um, I, I find that uh, really, really, really interesting um, and also yeah, saves a lot of time. Um, and one change which we have then in software development um, was the test-driven development. And this was um, also the point where I began to think a little bit about um, yeah, generating code. Um, and this is why I would like to tell you a little bit more about it. So first, I think as we have a lot of developers here, most of you know test-driven development. So you implement first a test, you check if it works. If it works, it means it should be read because you have not implemented any code yet. Um, then you write the code, you run the tests again, you check that it's now green. Um, now you can refactor all your code and you repeat the steps because you're doing that in a, in a baby step way. And I said, so what we want to like to focus now is the part of writing the code. Um, and there's one yet yeah, a training out there called the evil twin um, if you are doing test driven development. Um, the evil twin means that two people are actually sitting then in front of a PC, um, so like pair programming. One is implementing the test, and after that, the other one is implementing the code. But he's trying to write code um, which passes the test but does not do what it was intended to do. So to make a small example, you could have a test for a calculator, 2 plus 2 should be 4. The code should always return 4. The, past, uh, the test passes. Um, if you enter then as an input 3 plus 4 plus 4, it would still return 4. Um, so the, the challenge is actually, or the, the idea behind the training is to show you, okay, you really need to think really, really well about your tests and, and, and to craft them uh, pretty well. Um, but this made me think about, okay, if it's so easy to pass a test, um, could we not somehow brute force that? Um, so let me create the test first. Um, and then we have some kind of, uh, again, the infinite um, monkey who is then writing code. And let's, let's see what passes. Um, unfortunately, um, that does not work. And the reason for that is that you cannot um, brute force code. Um, and here I like the comparison between uh, chess um, and Go. Um, so chess was more or less solved by computers um, in the 90s um, by a computer. I think its name was Deep Blue. Um, probably most of you have heard of it. Um, and that was simply brute forcing chess. I um, was just checking, okay, what are the next moves that are technically possible because the amount is very limited um, at the end. Um, this is not possible with Go simply for the fact there are so many movements um, possible as a next step and you need to go uh, in really, really deep level levels and more think about patterns um, that you cannot prove for us, um, a game like Go. Um, and this is the same for software development. Nevertheless, um, there are right now um, really, really good um, neural networks out there um, who are really good Go players. Therefore, if we can do this with a computer game, why shouldn't it also be possible uh, with software development? Nevertheless, um, from the 40s where we had Assembler and then Fortran with 50, we now have a slew of different programming languages. But fundamentally, nothing really changed in my opinion. We are still writing code. Um, we are now doing the ifs and the go-tos and the loops, um, writing some classes and functions. But it's very similar uh, to what we have done um, 60 years ago. Um, that didn't change. Um, Therefore, there's currently a term out there called software 2.0. Um, it sounds like a buzzword, but anyway, I wanted to mention it here. So also if you Google it, you will find um, some documentation about it. Um, and one program which fits into software 2.0 um, is DeepCoder. Um, who of you has heard of DeepCoder? One. Not too many. OK, interesting. Um, DeepCoder is actually a program um, which um, writes program for you. Uh, so it's a neural, sorry, it's a neural network uh, which writes program for you. Um, if you Google it for the very first time, um, you will see news like that. Um, so it steals code from Slack Overflow. It steals code from other software. Um, actually, all of this is not true. This is really bad journalism out there. Um, but it seems to be a really um, catchy headline. Um, it is not stealing any code. Um, so how is it working? We have here um, a typical challenge. Um, so, for example, there's a shop um, who is selling paintings um, and it has X paintings um, in his shop. And you want now to buy one painting for each of your friends. 
Um, and as an example, we have here, you have two friends. That's the input. Um, and then the three, five, four, seven, five, that's the array of the prices of the paintings. Um, and the obvious solution for that is, so you want to spend less money. Sorry, I forgot that at the end, but it's, it's the last sentence in the, uh, here. Return the minimal um, amount of money you will need to spend. Um, again, I'm also Swabian, so don't spend too much money. And um, the real solution, or the best solution, is here the seven, because you can buy a painting for three, one for four. You have two friends, so you need to spend seven. So what is DeepCoder now doing with that? Um, First of all, um, it's based um, on a list of first order and higher order functions. Um, so you need to be aware of right now, um, in 2019, it's limited because also here there are no loops while branch is possible. Um, so it has a limited scope which we can solve. Um, and then it's doing a prediction on which of these functions um, should be used um, in that program, um, also bringing them into an order. And at the end, so this is, this is a real example, it comes up with this program um, here on the left. So it defines k, which is the number of friends as an integer. Then it defines b as an array of integer, that's the price of the paintings. Then it sorts the array b, so the result of that array should now be 3, 4, 5, 5, 7. It takes the number of friends, amount of elements from that array, so the 3 and 4, and sums it up. Quite easy. But so far, we were doing that manually. I mean, this is already possible. As an input right now, DeepCoder is only using what you see here as the input-output example. So it's not considering the description at all. Um, and this is, again, where it's really similar uh, to test-driven development. You have some kind of input-output data. You have your assertion. Um, but now it generates your code. Um, it's said in a limited field yet, um, but it's starting. Um, nevertheless, um, if we now think about BDD, um, so there could be a BDD, um, or there is actually a BDD language like that. Um, and if you connect something like that, then with DeepCoder, you don't have some weird input and outputs. Actually, a project manager, or at least um, a business-trained uh, developer, um, uh, sorry, a, a, a development-trained business guy, um, could somehow write these tests and therefore could generate um, some simple code out of it. Um, Another tool, um, and that's actually then more like the next level, is Sketch Adapt. Um, so first of all, they claim it's better than DeepCoder, uh, the neural network at all, of course. If you do something new, it needs to be better. Um, but it also can decide um, actually on its own if it knows the solution or if it just is doing a guess right now uh, for that code. That leads to the point that it generates code um, where it's 100% sure this is the right code. Um, and there are parts where it's not sure about, um, but it then does a guess, also comments that in the code. Now the developer actually just needs to do the quality insurance, check what is written there, does it make sense, yes or no, um, and then can agree to it um, or change it. Um, so this is, for me, very important as, as a next level, so it's more like giving suggestions. Um, currently, we still understand what it's doing for now. Um, I mean with that, we can still read the code that it's generating. Um, the next level could actually be, why should it not write code in assembly? Because right now we have a machine which is writing code for a machine. So now we are s have still have the higher level functions out there which, which are used, um, simply also for the reason these are some kind of patterns, um, so it makes it easier for the neural network. Um, but in the future, it could also directly generate assembler um, or even binary code. Um, and this will then fundamentally, at least in my opinion, um, change how we are working in software development. Um, and it's not only my crazy idea, um, actually then also to bring um, some guy who really has um, expertise in these, um, in, into, into the topic. Um, so yeah, the, the director of AI at Tesla um, really defends um, this opinion and idea about the future, how software development will look like. So that we will more focus on yeah, visualizing um, and massaging and cleaning the data sets which we need um, and the code um, for big parts will only be automatically generated. And the idea is more, or the question is more like now, okay, how also might an ID, IDE for that look like in the future? How can we assign labels? Um, could an IDE also do some suggestions on that? Like for example, okay, here we had some kind of a network error. How can I label that? 
Um, so in my opinion, uh, the question is not if, but which job will it kill first? Or if you put it more in like in a positive way, um, which one will it optimize first? Because um, at least in my opinion, the, the typical job of a code monkey won't be there in the future. Yes, we still need software developers, but we also need to evolve um, on the new tools and the new challenges that we have out there. Um, and this is already happening. And yeah, then coming back to the girls, um, or uh, to the to the to the story of Salando. Um, so well, what have these people doing? So two of these girls um, actually turned that weakness which they had, so have they have been laid down, um, into a strength. Um, so they teach themselves in Python um, and in data science. Um, have created um, a German language um, a blog about um, AI and marketing, which has not been there before. And now um, they are highly booked on conferences, um, also have a lot of high paid jobs out there um, and simply use the chance um, to, to learn something um, and simply also evolve um, their career overall and, and be open for the change. Um, so I'm not afraid at all um, over that situation. I'm actually yeah, looking forward to the moment when we want to add a new button into our app. I don't need to scroll around 100 or 1,000 1, lines of code. I can simply change our test um, or, our, or the description language which we are using, um, and then it's simply happening. Um, as mentioned before, um, so we have the AI meetup in Frankfurt, um, and one topic uh, which we want to cover um, in one of our next events, um, and the next event is actually um, an AI hackathon, um, is about okay, software development and AI. How will it work together um, and change in the future? Um, so right now um, we have a really really easy Mailchimp newsletter list. Uh, but if you are interested and would like to yeah, spend a weekend full of with other nerds um, in, in a room. Um, and learn about it um, and maybe also change um, your thinking about, okay, how AI will influence that. Um, please sign up. Um, and I'm looking forward to having you there. Um, yeah, I said, one opinion. Um, does anyone have any other ideas um, or minds out there? Happy for having a discussion. I will bring you the mic one second. Yeah, all good. Geht nicht? Okay. Also. So, basically what I was thinking is, will AI replace the developer by writing code? Mm -hmm. Or will the AI do the stuff that the code's supposed to do? So, will we need to write code? Or will we only have a bunch of AIs, like on the phone and everywhere else? So that there's no need for the AI to write a program to do something, mm -hmm. because an AI will do the thing that's supposed to be done. Right? Yeah. So uh, I was thinking about this, maybe. Yeah. Interesting idea. So uh, in, I will try to rephrase this, and you tell me if I got it right. Uh, it was um, quite hard uh, to get the point, but the idea um, was. Um, if we actually uh, still need code in the future at all, or if the AIs on our phone actually will already know uh, what we want to do with it. Um, so there might be no need for it, because at the end it's just some logical operations. Yeah, um, Maybe w another step ahead, um, but interesting idea, thanks. Yes, over there. So the, the point was um, that probably then um, we will more work for the AI helping it uh, to understand all the data. And uh, this is actually what, what Andre um, is telling um, also on his blog posts about, okay, we of course need to prepare the data and help it to understand it. Um, but the, the coding work, the old coding work that we have been doing now for several decades uh, won't be there then anymore. Yeah. 
Yes, over there. So, so the, the point was that um, my, my opinion is that we will change um, the, the code monkey to a data monkey. Um, it depends what we, what we are doing out of it. At the end, yes, we need to do some work. <laughs> um, and then also code monkey is very sarcastic somehow. Um, so I don't see myself or my developers as monkeys at all. I just This was just an example to also express, OK, now you can solve the easy parts. Um, and yes, we are not there yet, um, but this will change. And the same is actually true for data. Um, but um, one thing which I find really interesting is right now sitting together with data scientists. Um, and I think these two kind of jobs will not merge, but work really, really closely together. Yes. Yeah, so an int interesting idea. So the point was um, the part of the software development job is, is writing the code, but a, lot, a big part is actually also then the architecture. Um, but you're talking then really about software architecture or the business architecture. More, more like, like software, like um, what kind of... Uh, yeah. Or, or yeah. Like yeah, so, so it was more about our software architecture. <laughs> It's really, it's an opinion and, and looking really, really forward, but I could see a world, as mentioned, where we do not need to think about architecture because of that reason, then the machines are using um, assembler as an example or directly binary files, then you don't have something like that. Right now, uh, architecture mainly we use for thinking about okay, how can we change code in the future fast and easily. An AI doesn't care about that because writing code for it is super fast. So if I implement version 1.0 of my app and uh, version 1.1 could actually be a completely new code generation because it's extremely fast if, I, if the AI is generating that. So I don't know if there's that much need anymore to think about architecture, but what is really important is that this will give us way more time and understanding the business problem and thinking about the business problem. Uh, I think this is where everything will change and uh, we need to be yeah, more interested and open for that. Does this answer your question? Yes, okay. Yes, over there. I mean, isn't uh, programming just becoming more like pretty much any other job out there uh, because of what AI will be publishing? I mean, just think about, for instance, architecture, which is a good example. Um, nowadays, when you go to university, you study architecture for five years or something. Probably when you get out of university, you don't calculate the statics of the building by yourself. That's mostly done by software. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the point was that also development will get into a, a normal job uh, where you study something, um, but probably not implement exactly like that what you have learned um, then in school um, into the real world. Um, but it's more about learning in the school how to understand what is actually happening um, in the basics. Um, yeah, so uh, first of all, I didn't study, so I'm not the perfect guy uh, to talk about that. <laughs> um, but um, I think it's really, really important to understand the basics. It's actually the reason why I looked into assembler. Yeah, first of all, it's fun, but also I also want to understand the, what, what it's doing and how it's working. Um, and this is why I'm also not afraid about what AI will do, because still it will be some ones and o's, which I understand, basically. Yes, yeah, I had then the back first. Um, <laughs> from project management point of view, isn't that incredibly increasing the risk? Because as we all know, 
Yeah. So the, the question was, um, if, if is there's not a huge risk um, that actually AI will do something different than uh, we wanted to do because the test cases have not been well enough um, or something like that. Um, yes, this exists. Um, on the other side, I'm writing, as I said, software for a very long time. I think I have not written one program which was bug-free as a human. Um, so it's a, simple, it's a similar discussion as with autonomous driving cars. Yes, they do accidents, but humans as well. Uh, this is yeah. But what I meant is, as a project manager, um, when I now know that um, the developer did this himself, and I tell him the no new case, and then he can estimate the risk and the, the, yeah, uh, yeah, the impact of the new test on what he de did. Mm -hmm. That depends. So, however, the AI is then built because the AI is uh, intelligent at the end is doing predictions, um, and it could also be one which is then predicting the, the impact um, on the code of overall. But then, then the question is also what kind? What 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 do you want to solve? Do you just want to know how many lines of code have been changed? That it definitely can do. It, it, uh, simply, you just generate both codes um, and then compare it. Uh, this is quite easily possible. Yeah. Yeah, then here in the back. I just wanted to get uh, an answer to the point. I think um, the simple solution to that would be um, just not to release it to everyone. Like um, many companies today, mm -hmm. the, the data driven already release changes just to, let's say, 1% of the time. So they yeah. monitor what's going on. If they like it, if it's bug free and so yeah. on, and uh, it's, it's considered stable after a while, then they release it to all. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we, um, as I said, we have the same effect or same risks actually as for, as for humans. Um, and there are so if it's a resolution, I don't know, but it at least reduces the risk um, to deploying it only to a part um, of the audience first. Uh, just checking if I missed somewhere over there, but no, okay, <laughs> then please. <laughs> So the question is, how, how do we dealing with GDPR and other audit-related things where we actually need to know, okay, what is really happening and be sure that something is not happening as well. Um, so right now, as long as we're on the higher level functions, you can do a code audit. That is actually done anyway. So for example, our company um, it is certified by the TÜV. They are doing a, an audit by a human um, that can be done as well. If we are then going into a more future-driven way, like having a sender, this might be get really, really difficult. Um, I don't know how many guys are still out there who are not understand the sender that much. Um, I'm definitely not one of them. Um, if it's binary, um, then it might get even... I, I don't have an answer. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Just to give an example, for example, there's deepfakes, you know? Yeah. AI is used to generate like videos of that people. And there's companies already using AI that can kind of detect deepfake videos. Yeah. yeah. So the, the <laughs> basic idea is like you can of of course train AI to um to do this with other AI. Like one AI to check the other. So that might be a problem. Yeah. 
Yeah, fair, fair points. So if, if someone didn't get it over there, so it was like, for example, for deepfake, there's now already an AI which is detecting um, a deepfake. So th there could also be an AI which is then doing the GDPR audit, something like that. Yeah, but uh, it's very really theoretical. This is <laughs> we don't know how, how future will change. There was someone over here, I think. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'm to support this point where we don't know what the code is uh, uh, generated by the AI. I mean, your uh, little example with the two inputs and one output already, like there were many possibilities the code have, had, uh, uh, could have looked like. Yeah. But like, how did it come up with this one? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, seven could be outputted just by outputting like one of the yeah. uh, inputs. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the argument was that in this example there could be several ways how you actually come to the to the number seven. Um, this is just a really really simplified example. So you would give it only one test case, uh, actually a, a lot of them. Um, but this is just an approach somehow. So I see it more like okay, it should read the description. Um, think about the business problem, uh, the problem, and, uh, and understand it basically. Yeah. Was, was this code only written by like one input and I, I mean two inputs and one output? Or was no. There, there are several ones. This is just for your explanation to make it easier. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah here in the front. I don't think that AI will make our jobs awesome. Mm -hmm. I think that, just as you said, like, it will optimize our jobs. It will support us with the image of things. Like, because AI will become more and more a part of our normal life. So, so the point was um, AI will probably not kill the job of a software developer, but you're optimizing and being more like a teacher, um, which is definitely also what I see at least as a first step. And um, then we will see how, how it evolves. But right now, so what I mentioned, sketch adapt, and um, that's giving you a suggestion how the code could look like. Um, and then you, you are deciding. So um, it's giving you some ideas. Yeah, um, I think we are out of time, right? Yeah. Um, thanks a lot. Um, I'm happy to talk also then in the hallway because uh, for me it's a really interesting discussion. I can also learn a lot as well. Thank you.